Hi everyone, welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics Seminar Series. I'm Andrea Bianchi and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speaker is Patrick Garan Sayeg and his seminar is entitled Specialists versus Generalists, Finding Common Knowledge Among Reasonable Physicians in Malpa Mal Malpractice Trials. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded. This lecture, along with other archive lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics website. The format of our seminar is a presentation by our speaker, followed by a facilitated discussion period. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Patrick Garan Sayeg is a lawyer and doctoral candidate at the Faculty of Law, University of Toronto. His research focuses on the law of medical malpractice, medical legal argumentation, expertise, and expert evidence. His dissertation specifically examines how lawyers and medical experts argue in the courtroom to establish facts and determine whether or not malpractice occurred in a given case. I'll turn it over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, thank you and hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I have no idea how many of you are out there, but uh, I want to welcome you as warmly as I can across this uh, cold, cold medium that we find ourselves confined to. Um, I hope that you will find my talk interesting and I look forward to hearing your questions. So I'd like to start with a bit of context for my presentation. Um, this presentation is an outgrowth of my dissertation, which focuses on medical malpractice or medical negligence. The words are interchangeable. And I ask, so how do we define cases of malpractice? How, how do we identify, sorry, cases of malpractice? How do we come to know whether or not a given physician was negligent in a specific case? And I try to answer these questions by examining a lawyer's argumentative or rhetorical strategies in the courtroom. And the questions, obviously, of malpractice and courtroom argumentation are important from a legal perspective, but I think they can be of interest to bioethicists and healthcare practitioners more generally, because malpractice or negligence are highly charged and contested terms which circulate beyond legal arenas. So people of all sorts can label the actions of another as instances of negligence or malpractice. And regardless of whether or not these terms are used in a legal sense or not, these terms contain an implicit moral slash ethical claim. That is, by labeling an action as negligent or malpractice, we single out the action, and perhaps the person who did it, as blameworthy in some way or another. And so by studying how we identify and argue over cases of malpractice in the law, I hope to gain insights into how we identify and argue over blame more generally. Now, of course, given the particular, uh, uh, particular nature of the courtroom context, some of my findings will no doubt be limited to that context. However, we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which legal terms and legal culture more generally are taken up in general or lay culture. Conversely, legal argumentation doesn't occur in a vacuum. When lawyers argue over what is negligent or not, they are drawing on resources, that is arguments, that are already within the general culture in which they share. The law, if we go to wax metaphorical for the moment, uh, is by no means hermetic. It is a leaky vessel and it leaks both ways. And so the value of courtroom proceedings, part of the value of uh, studying these proceedings, is that they make visible and explicit certain things that in other contexts would remain implicit. So, so much for the, the general context. Um, today, I want to share with you my thoughts on an important related question, uh, which is also a part of my dissertation. Um, and the question is, well, who, whom do we ask? Or who is qualified to tell us what counts as malpractice? Uh, 
Indeed, most of us can't know what counts as malpractice on our own. Um, and even physicians can quickly become hard pressed to uh, comment on the work of their colleagues in other specialties or even in the same specialty, but in a different um, practice context. Now, our initial instinct may be to say that there isn't really much of a question here at all. Our instinct might be to say, it's easy. We just need to find another physician with the right credentials. Um, that is, you know, credentials that match the person accused, uh, the physician accused of negligence. But today we'll see that there is a lot more to it than that. And before moving to the topic at hand, I want to cover some of the you know, basics of the legal background to make sure that we're all on the same page. So at the heart of a malpractice lawsuit is the question of whether or not the defendant physician met the standard of care. And the standard of care is simply in legal language, the reasonable physician placed in the same circumstances. And so the injured patient, the plaintiff, must prove what the applicable standard of care was in her case and that the defendant failed to meet the standard. The patient must also prove that they suffered damages and those damages were caused by the failure to meet the standard. But today we're only gonna discuss really the standard or at least indirectly discuss the standard. Proving the standard requires an expert in the vast majority of cases. Uh, indeed, plaintiff's cases are almost, summar uh, almost always summarily dismissed if they don't have an expert. So malpractice trials routinely feature medical expert witnesses on both sides of the case because well, defendant physicians essentially always hire experts. So this makes malpractice trials perfect for studying certain forms of medical argumentation and the strategic moves that lawyers and expert witnesses will make to persuade the judge. What is particularly interesting about the standard of care is that it's what we call uh, in legal jargon, a mixed question of fact and law. That is, the standard of care is a matter of characterizing action. It's not simply a matter of determining a quote, brute physical fact. A brute physical fact will be, for example, that a given person was at a given location at a given point in time, or you know, some CSI thing, like a given bullet was shot by a given gun. These can be seen as you know, brute physical facts, spatial temporal questions. Characterizing action, on the other hand, is this mixed question of fact and law. Also interesting is the fact that in medical malpractice, we have experts testifying against peers. Uh, the indeed, the, the defendant physicians are themselves experts and the tables could easily be turned. And so this makes the issue of matching credentials, especially salient, that's the instinct, right? And so we come closer to the topic at hand. Medical experts are who are brought to testify on the standard of care sometimes face the specialist to specialist rule or conversely, the generalist to generalist rule. So the idea behind this rule is essentially a concern for fairness. So it would be unfair for defendants who are general practitioners to expect them to know what specialists know. And similarly, it would be unfair to plaintiffs if specialists were held to the standard of generalists because specialists are supposed to know more. And so they ought to be held to a higher standard. That said, uh, this rule, the specialist to specialist rule, as sometimes called, is, isn't really a rule because whether or not a specialist can testify against a generalist or a generalist against a specialist is decided on a case by case basis. And this decision is made at the end of what we call a voir dire, which is uh, a kind of miniature trial that happens within the trial that leads to a decision on the uh, issue of uh, whether or not a given expert is allowed to testify on a given topic. And so it's a miniature trial in a trial because there's a, its own question period and, and, and examination and cross-examination and at the end the judge rules as to whether or not the person uh, proposed as an expert is, you know, is an expert. So using Thomas Guerin's famous terms, we can say that the voir dire is, a, is the process by which boundaries are drawn around the jurisdiction in which the expert has epistemic authority. Or following another science studies scholar, uh, Michael Lynch, we can say that the voir dire is the process by which a person's, a person's membership in the category, quote, expert, and the authorization 
or authority to speak that comes with membership in this category is circumscribed by other locally relevant category. And as we'll see in the case that we will examine, the categories of specialist and generalist were of special relevance. So the case is called um, Barber and Humber Ridge River Regional Hospital. So this is a Toronto case which took place uh, perhaps not far from where some of you are right now. And I'll give you a simplified version of the facts, which is more than sufficient for present purposes. Uh, the patient went to the ER and was seen by an ER physician who ran tests on the patient and then discharged them pending the results of the tests. The patient was then called back to the ER after blood tests showed bacteria in his blood, but by then it was too late. The infection had progressed too much and the patient died of bacterial meningitis. And so the plaintiff's family sued the ER physician. Uh, they claimed that the physician failed to meet the standard of care by missing signs of the infection and discharging the patient. Uh, in essence, they argued that the physician hadn't been so thorough enough. The defense argued, on the other hand, that the physician acted reasonably and that the defendant, uh, sorry, the, the, the infection presented in an atypical manner in this patient. In other words, lack of thoroughness wasn't the problem. Uh, the patient's infection was a non-obvious case and it could easily be missed on initial examination. And indeed, that's why blood tests were needed. So uh, the plaintiffs called two experts. The plaintiff had an ER physician to testify on the standard of care and an infectious diseases specialist to testify on causation. And the defendants essentially mirrored this lineup, but there was a twist. So the plaintiffs wanted their infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Fong, to testify on both causation and the standard of care. And so the defendants, in response, wanted to block Dr. Fong from testifying on the standard of care. And therein lay the controversy that will occupy us for the rest of the presentation. So to understand the controversy, it was strategically essential for the plaintiffs to separate the standard of care and causation and have an expert for each. And this was dictated by the nature of the case. Specifically, they needed an infectious diseases specialist because the progression of bacterial meningitis raises complex scientific questions that fall outside most ER physicians' competence, at least as was uh, presented in this case. Also, uh, the defendants were sure to bring an infectious disease specialist regardless because they would attempt to break the chain of causation. And so the plaintiffs needed to be, uh, sorry, needed to be prepared on that front uh, by having an infectious disease specialist of their own. At the same time, it would have been too risky to call Fong alone. Uh, because as an infectious disease specialist, you know, uh, they called him to testify on both causation and the standard of care because of the generalist to generalist rule. Uh, the plaintiffs had no guarantee that Fong would be able to testify on the standard of care. Uh, had they called him on that, and, all, and he, he was the only expert on the standard of care and he had been blocked at the end of his wazir, uh, their lawsuit, the plaintiff's lawsuit would have been over. So they needed an ER physician as well. Now the plaintiffs split their qualification request because at the end of the voir dire, basically the lawyers have to request that, to the judge that the expert be qualified, quote, um, given you know, a set of qualifications uh, that will circum circumscribe their authority to speak. Um, and so this qualification request by the plaintiff was split into two components. The first component was supposed to be, quote, safe, but we will see that there was a struggle even on that point. Now, I apologize for reading slides, but I really don't see any other way to do this. So the plaintiff started, the plaintiff's lawyer said, Your Honor, I'd like to have Dr. Fong qualified to give his opinion on the diagnosis and treatment of infectious diseases and outcomes, and in particular with respect to the strep pneumonia and its complications, including meningitis. So the judge asked if there were any objections and the defendant said, I think not. As long as it's not speaking to the standard of care applicable to emergency room physicians, it's not entirely clear from the way my friend framed it. If he's asking about whether this expert has the qualification to opine generally on prognosis for bacterial meningitis, I take no issue with that. So we see that the defendant's lawyer in the third paragraph immediately tried to constrain the expert's freedom to speak by making uh, ER physician standard of care off limits to him. 
So the lawyer made two moves. First, she flagged an ambiguity in the initial part of the qualification request. This ambiguity lay in the words, uh, diagnosis and treatment of infectious diseases. Indeed, ER physicians are also called upon to do this uh, as often as infectious diseases specialists. And so the meaning of the phrase had to be specified and made off limits to the expert in this case. The second move was complementary. The lawyer proposed a reformulation of the expert's jurisdiction by switching the phrase diagnosis and treatment of infectious diseases with opine generally on prognosis. So the interesting thing about this move is that if it affected a kind of reversal. It used the term generally for an expert who is a specialist and conversely suggested that ER physicians are engaged in a form of specialized work falling outside the specialist's jurisdiction. If we move now to the second component of the qualification request, we'll see that the plaintiff, continue, uh, the plaintiff continued by saying, and I was going to ask the court to permit Dr. Fong to opine on the standard of care expected of a physician who has completed his internship and general medical studies, having regard to the circumstances surrounding the patient's admission to the hospital, and whether that standard that is expected of any physician was met in that case. And so we see that right away the defendant objected to that uh, part of the request. And the judge asked for clarification saying, so it's not specifically with respect to an emergency room doctor, it's any physician? And the plaintiff replied, well, as Dr. Fong testified to, it's just this general knowledge that should be within the realm of knowledge of any physician, whether he's an ER doctor or family doctor or what have you. So the second component was crafted to sidestep the defendant's objection. The lawyer predicted that the standard of care of ER physicians would be fought over. And so long as the situation was framed in terms of generalist versus specialist, he had a problem. So instead he framed the experts, the experts testimony as one that would apply to all physicians. Now note that before making this qualification request, the plaintiff's lawyer posed a number of questions to support it, drawing on elements in the expert's CV. The purpose of all these questions was to lay factual grounding upon which the plaintiff's lawyer would later be able to defend against the objection that he anticipated would be brought against the qualification request. So in uh, these, uh, this, this questioning on the CV, two themes were key. The first theme was Fong's teaching experience, um, which included numerous questions aimed at highlighting his teaching appointments, such as you know, which university he taught at, at. Uh, his teaching awards, you know, what were they and why they were awarded, um, how he delivered his teachings, was it in seminar, was it in a lecture, um, to whom did he teach, so did he teach only medical students and residents, but also, uh, but also physicians in general practice, um, also questions regarding the period during which he taught, the geographic area in which he would be routinely called to teach. All these questions were designed to establish Fong as an experienced medical educator, who taught and still taught medical students and uh, other physicians in the greater Toronto area for many years. And so the idea here was to make his teaching experience as generalizable as possible. The next big theme concerned the content of what he taught in uh, what he taught to medical students and residents, as well as uh, the medical school curriculum in general. So these questions show that he was a clinical professor, that he didn't just teach theory. Um, here are some examples. So we see that one question was well, when you are teaching your students in your infectious disease clinic about bacterial meningitis, in particular in this case, what do you say to the students or suggest that they look for? Another question was, well, in your personal experience, is this information provided to medical students as a matter of course? Uh, to, to which he answered that, well, yes, it is. And there are certain core subjects that we expect medical students to know. And the, so the lawyer followed up and said, well, what are those core subjects to which, you know, he gave a lengthy response and the lawyer followed that up by asking, well, are these things that you teach your students? And he confirmed that, well, yes, uh, these are things that he taught his students and so far that they've related to infectious diseases. So the issue of core subjects was especially crucial to the plaintiff strategy, because if something is at the core of the medical curriculum, then all reasonable physicians, be they generalists or specialists, should be expected to know it. Now that we've looked at the plaintiff's uh, strategy, let's look at what the defendants did to try to undercut the qualification request. 
So there was essentially three tactics. Uh, boundary work, uh, I call them boundary work following uh, Thomas Guerin, uh, distinguishing practice environments, and raising fairness considerations. So we'll look at these each quickly uh, in, in succession. So boundary work uh, consisted of an aggressive line of questions, which insisted on what Fong was not and what he didn't do. And notice how these are questions that are you know, aggressive and posed in a really yes, no uh, format. Uh, they can only be answered by yes or no. And obviously the lawyer in this case was asking them because she already knew the answer and was trying to box the, uh, the expert in. So these questions were, I take it you'll agree with me that you're not an emergency room physician. Correct. You've never practiced as an, as an emergency room physician, not an independent, not in Canada. And I assume you're consulted from time to time by emergency room physicians, correct. But when you're doing so, that's when that emergency room physician has already made a determination that the patient requires your involvement, whether as an internal medicine specialist or as infectious diseases specialist. Yeah, they're usually seen by the emergency physician who requires a consultation. And Dr. Fong, am I correct that you've never been qualified in any court to give evidence as an expert in emergency room physician? Not specifically, emergency room medicine, sorry. Not specifically as an expert. So once again, we see how these questions are designed to wall Fong in and to distinguish his jurisdiction or his like realm of authority from that of other ER physicians, of, of ER physicians. The next strategy was distinguishing practice environments. And so here the questions were, well, you'll agree with me that, you're, that you work at what's called a tertiary care hospital, correct? And you'll agree with me that Humber River Regional is not a tertiary care center. I would agree with that. Indeed, from time to time, patients from Humber might be transferred to St. Michael's where you work because they require a higher level of care than can be provided at Humber River. Correct. Once again, we see that these questions were designed to highlight the extent to which Fong's practice was different from that of the defendant. His practice was not only different because of his credentials, it was also different because he practiced in a different environment. And finally, fairness concerns. Um, these questions were, well, and you'll agree with me that you have far more training than most emergency room physicians do in the area of infectious diseases, correct? And you've spent far more time doing research in the area than probably any emergency room physician, correct? And in that respect, you have far more knowledge than any emergency room physician would have about infectious diseases generally, correct? and about bacterial meningitis specifically. Correct. And indeed, probably more with any kind of bacterial infection, including, say, a community-acquired pneumonia caused by bacteria. Correct. Uh, we'll note that in this case, the bacterial meningitis was indeed a, a complication of community-acquired pneumonia. So all of these questions were designed to drive home the point that it would be unfair to have Fong judge the defendant after the fact. And so I'd like to sum up in conclusion with a few ideas. The tactics that I briefly discussed here, I mean, this, this is a, just a, 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 a thin slice of a trial, um, but it gives us something to think about. Um, and so the, the, these tactics that, that we see in this thin slice uh, can be described using the language of rhetorician Kenneth Burke. Uh, for Kenneth Burke, rhetoric essentially boiled down to the means we use to create identification or division. Uh, that is, we use language to identify things, that is to associate them, to bring them together. And then well, we use language to divide, well, to divide. So the study of rhetoric on his view uh, is the study of how we achieve identification or division through language. And if we take this on what we take this and apply it to what we've just seen, we can say that the generalist versus specialist framing created division between Fong's knowledge, Fong's authority and experience, and the experience, knowledge, and authority of that of the defendant or ER physicians more, more generally. And so the defendant, uh, the defendant's lawyer, insisted on this division and this generalist versus specialist framing in an attempt to try to exclude Fong from the jurisdiction uh, of import, which was the standard of care of emergency room physicians. 
the, diff the different tactics uh, were mobilized, the, different, the three different tactics that we saw, they were mobilized in order to accentuate this division uh, between specialist generals, between Fong and the defendant. The plaintiffs, on the other hand, needed to overcome division by creating identification, which can be thought of as a form of consubstantiality between Fong on the one hand and the defendant on the other. And so the plaintiff insisted on elements which identified Fong and the defendant, most notably the fact that both of them were at the end of the day physicians and that Fong had extensive experience teaching physicians who were similarly situated to the defendant. And to really zoom out now for a moment uh, before I close and, and, and on a more general considerations for you in the audience who are perhaps likely not, uh, you know, lawyers or medical malpractice litigators and so on, and interested more generally in, uh, in bioethics and expertise and so on. Um, I think what one of the, one of the lessons that I, I, I'm trying to get across here is that we are routinely taught and told that the um, ad hominem argument is a fallacy. So there's this, uh, the, this idea of the ad hominem fallacy is that you, know, you, you can't you know, win arguments or you like making arguments about the person uh, who is making arguments against you is, is fallacious. It doesn't allow you to, uh, you know, it doesn't get you anywhere. It's, it's, it's wrong in whatever way you want to qualify it. Um, this here shows that who experts are matters. And I would say that this is, like I said, just a thin slice. We could go on and on like this for a long time. But I think that this drives home the point that who experts are, who someone is when they speak on a given topic matters, where they, where they came from, what they were doing, uh, what they do in their daily lives, and so on and so forth, really matters. And it's, it's counterintuitive, once again, to think that because once again, we're taught that, well, no, it doesn't matter. It's only data or evidence or reason or whatever that matters. And I, I submit that it's a much more complicated picture. And it's a, I think that we've been in the past year and a half, um, more than a year and a half now, uh, submerged in uh, disputes, often very acrimonious disputes, uh, about who has the uh, who is the expert like who, who can pronounce themselves on what public health measure is appropriate who uh, is able to pronounce themselves on the spread of covid or the uh, you know the usefulness of wearing masks or whatever um, there is a tendency to how do you say there's a tendency, and I, I tend to you look, well, if we're talking about vaccines, I'd like to, you know, hear infectious diseases specialists, epidemiologists, uh, virologists, you know, biologists. But this is very much the credential mindset that I was telling you about, which is totally fine and natural. I mean, we have, this is a shortcut that is part of a general culture. When we're looking for an expert, we look for credentials. But once again, uh, what I have here uh, what I've presented here suggests that, well, yeah, credentials are part of the picture, but they're not the whole picture by any means. And so a malpractice case is far simpler in many ways than, you know, huge questions of pandemic policy. Uh, but if you observe, and I invite you to observe following the vocabulary, the small smidgen of vocabulary that um, I've provided today, which I hope can be useful to you in some ways, is to think, well, when you see people arguing, what, like, pay attention to see how these resources are mobilized to identify people with certain things. Like, how are we drawing links between this being important and that being important vis a vis this person? And so that's about my time. And uh, I'm going to thank you and hand it over to questions. And please, I look forward to the most devastating questions possible. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, uh, I certainly learned a lot. This is not my area of expertise, no pun intended. Um, I 
I learned a lot from that and I'm confident that everyone listening did as well. As we're waiting, because there is a delay, we're waiting for any questions or any comments to come in. Um, I do have a number of comments for myself actually. Um, one of which is, and this may be somewhat outside of the scope, but it is something I'm curious about. It does seem like the credential mindset is something that we are very much fixated on. Who you are matters when it comes to being determined um, an expert or not. And I'm just curious as to whether, when it comes to malpractice trials and looking for experts, do values ever come into play? And to, what, what, I, what I mean by this is, if there is a person, um, perhaps this isn't a great example, Patrick, in which case I apologize, but if there is a physician, let's say, that is known to be a part of a particular um, religious organization, or, um, and not just organization, but let's just say they, they practice a particular faith, um, or a person who is from a particular um, part of the world that practices healthcare somewhat differently, and they may have certain values that they bring to their own practice. I guess I'm just wondering whether we ever go beyond credentials and whether we think about how values may inevitably influence our perspectives on things, including medicine. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, I'm sorry, I'm still thinking as I'm no. speaking, which is never a great thing. It's totally fine. It's a very good question. Thank you. And maybe I'll uh, while I uh, sort of try to answer, while I answer it, then maybe you'll tell me if 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 I've understood your question and you can uh, specify. Um, sure. So yeah, I mean, values certainly do come into play. This whole process of arguing over whether or not somebody is an expert or not is shot through with values. I mean, the, the you can say that it's it, you know the values are 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 the resources that lawyers and experts themselves are drawing on. We have in, in our culture, quote, um, things that we generally identify with epistemic authority for you know, knowledgeability and credentials are just one. And we either associate, you know, we, we associate some things with a positive sort of association, right? Like, okay, this is associated with knowledgeability. It's identified with knowledgeability. But on the other hand, there are other values that are negative, quote, or that we associate with being suspect, epistemically suspect. And so if we're going to go to the, let's say the question of religious practice, um, I would say that it is most certainly something that's, that, that will be drawn on in certain cases uh, to uh, disqualify um, uh, experts. I, I mean, it raises very thorny uh, questions of legal ethics uh, in general. Just like it's a wonderful question. Uh, to what extent does one's uh, religious beliefs uh, or practices or whatever um, or affiliate? You know, it can be po political as well. Like if somebody is, you know. Uh, uh, member of such and such a party, like a card carrying member of such and such a party, does that disqualify them? Now, there's two questions there. And says, does this disqualify in the courtroom or in, does this disqualify uh, in the tribunal of popular opinion? The, there's, once again, it's a leaky, it's a leaky vessel. The lawyer who tries it in the courtroom tries it because as a member of just the people, Lawyers know that, oh, this is something right now that uh, can disqualify, right? Maybe a hundred years ago or, you know, 50 years ago, religious observance was not something that made somebody epistemically suspect, at least, you know, not as widespread as it is here. But even there, being epistemically suspect because of um, uh, religious affiliation or any other form of, let's say, religious affiliation is also highly variable, and this start, starts to cut into your second, the second sort of example that you gave. It varies according to region. So I'm speaking to you from Quebec right now, and just for all sorts of cultural historical reasons, uh, religious observance uh, is extraordinarily suspect here. Uh, there is a uh, an outright uh, hostility. Uh, to uh, religion, 
uh, which is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, poisonous to the political culture. But anyways, that's a whole other kettle of fish. But uh, it remains that, uh, you know, in North America, you can imagine, let's say, religious observance in Quebec being something that's highly suspect, but, you know, somewhere in the south of the U.S., not being suspect at all, even perhaps being an inverse value, saying, oh, this guy, this, this, this physician, he goes to, to church or mosque every Sunday and, uh, or synagogue or whatever. Uh, he's a trustworthy person. So now that's the issue of, 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 of uh, let's say, religious observance. And then the same, same goes for, let's say, if we put that aside and we just say, look, there, we know that medicine, we talk about medicine as like using the term medicine su suggests unity as if there is this one thing. Whereas in reality, you know, me medical practice varies enormously. So we saw in this example, in this case, a little sliver of that. We're saying, look, like a tertiary care hospital is one thing. And, you know, practice in a tertiary care can have its own sort of dynamics. And in another setting, it can have its own other dynamics. Or, you, you know, in a, in a country like Canada, you know, geographically, right? If you're a family physician in downtown Toronto in some clinic, it's not the same kind of practice setting as, um, you know, in the far north. I mean, it's, it's just not. And what does that mean? How do we, should that be factored into account? How do we factor it into account? These are questions that we can, that we, that we work on and that we hash out. And then, so these are examples within Canada where we imagine that, oh, well, everybody passes the same exams or whatever, and, but even within the country. And then if you say, oh, I'm gonna fly in some expert from, from France or whatever, well, that's doable uh, if you have the money. Uh, I mean, if you don't, the patients usually don't have the money to fly in, you know, some high flying expert, uh, literally from, uh, you know, London or Paris or whatever, you know. Uh, but supposing they did, well, you still have to convince the judge that um, if, you know, the injury, you know, the, the, the physician being sued was practicing in Oshawa. Uh, like, why are you bringing me somebody from, from Oxford? Um, and is that appropriate? And we'll ask those questions. So I don't know, I apologize for the long answer, but I, I hope that gets at, that, that sort of gets at your question. No, oh, 100% it did and beyond. I continue to learn as you speak more about this. I had no idea that this process was so complex. So, so again, I really appreciate you sharing all of this and your talk. Um, a question came in just around the case that you presented. Why wouldn't the plaintiff firm simply have chosen to seek an emergency physician to opine on the standard of care? Is this a common practice? So they did have, so I didn't look at the, because uh, once again, I mean, uh, half an hour, um, I can do a lot. And the end, I still haven't fully figured out. Uh, so I don't know if uh, all of you out there in cyberspace, um, if you could give me some comments, if you have um, comments regarding how the hell I could present this in a more interesting way, because the, you know the, the way the arguments are structured, as I hope you saw, matters. And so, uh, you know, I'm stuck reading and doing things that I normally don't like to do is have PowerPoint slides with a lot of text on them and reading them out loud. It's less than ideal, but given the nature of the subject matter. Um, I, I fail to see any other way at this point, but if you have any brilliant ideas, which I'm sure you maybe do, please share them with me. Bracket that. So in this case, yes, they did bring an ER physician, but I didn't look at that aspect. The, 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 the crux was basically to try to have Fong testify on the standard of care as well was sort of like a double whammy. It was to say, look, we're going to go full on if we can try to, if we can pull this off because we have some you know, big shot, uh, you know, Professor Fong, Dr. Fong, Professor Fong is a professor at uh, the University of Toronto um, Faculty of Medicine, uh, you know, an authority in, in infectious diseases. So if you bring this, um, such an expert, uh, you know, you have to bring this expert uh, to deal with causation issues. And you're like, well, hey, why don't I try to also, you know, um, exploit a second line of argument which is to say, well, not only does this fail by the standard of an ER physician, but more globally, like I said, 
even a medical student should know this, right? And so that was the line, that was a line of, 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 of argument that uh, in order to do it, you needed to have somebody that could, you know, credibly speak to the medical education curriculum. So is it common? I mean, it depends on who you're, it, it, it's always case by case, but this is the kind of thing, this, this can be done for sure. Thank you. Um, another question is just, has there ever been a case where an expert, um, an expert physician was later demonstrated not to be an expert? Um, so for example, because a physician who they were testifying against was found guilty of malpractice, largely based on expert evidence, um, but then that physician was later found not guilty of malpractice, perhaps demonstrating that the, that the expert was incorrect. Okay, thank you for that question. I'm going to see how I can answer that. So, so I would say, I'll latch on to a word, this, the, the idea of correctness in this context. Uh, and this, this is going to be like, oh, I'm bloody lawyers, right? Um, but the, 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 the issue of correctness is perhaps not the best framing because whether or not there was malpractice is something that is decided by the court. Uh, I mean, for sure, then, if people want to, you know, have their own private conviction of, you know, ah, no, I believe, you know, that, that this was malpractice anyways, but it doesn't matter. Uh, from in the, For the purposes of the legal system, it's the, the, the court that decides. And so you have a first, you have a trial, first instance, and You'll, you'll, let's say the physician, um, uh, sorry, the, the experts for the defendants, or let's say, let's say the defendant wins, right? And they say, oh, there, there was no malpractice in this case. Uh, but then there's an appeal and uh, the, uh, the court of appeal can, you know, change the judgment um, or they can send it back for another trial and say, look, something, this, there, was a, there was a problem with the trial and we have to start over again. Um, whether or not we can say that, you know, what was correct in this context is, um, like I said, I don't think it, 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 it applies because the standard, there is no external standard by which you can measure correctness. Correctness is internal to the legal process itself, and it's internal to each case. Maybe you could say that, oh, if later there's evidence that is produced or we have evidence to believe that the uh, the physician one of the experts was 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 corrupt in some way right like that they they were lying about how things are done or or, or, or some form of dishonesty let's say that's something else because that's dishonesty that 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 that, that, that let's say literally corrupts the legal process. But if everybody is honest, and, and, and that's sort of, I mean, people don't necessarily like trials and like lawyers because, you know, it's argumentative and, and, and uh, uh, you know, oppositional kind of uh, thing that we do. Um, but, you know, uh, having read uh, this, uh, having, you know, having done trials myself, having read this, the trial transcripts of this case through and through, more times than I can count uh, from my dissertation um, and uh, you know read other trial transcripts. I mean, I, I think that more often than not, everybody is honest and, and coming to this just from different perspectives. And when you look in detail at cases, you see that it's just not that obvious when, whether or not, like we have sort of cases that yes, obviously it was malpractice. If you amputate the wrong leg, you don't need an expert to know that, you know, this was malpractice or, you know, so there are like paradigm cases of, okay, this is obviously malpractice, but that's not what we're talking about at trial. And that's what makes trial so interesting is that for a case to get to trial, typically it's because there's enough ambiguity that both parties think that there's a reason to, to, to invest all the time and energy, or else there'll be a settlement upstream. If there's a big screw up, and it's obviously a mistake, uh, 
you know, physicians are very well insured and there will be a settlement. Uh, and that's just how it goes because you're not going to go and humiliate, you know, humiliate yourself as a lawyer, but also have your, have, have your page, have your client, uh, you know, the defendant be humiliated by having the whole story of their botched, you know, work uh, made as public because uh, right, all of this is public. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers uh, the question. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, just going to the, are, are there any places where experts are determined in a different way for malpractice trials, namely in a way that alleviates some of the challenges that you've brought forward through your presentation? So the, there's a debate on this. I would say there are different ways of naming experts. For example, in the, uh, you know, quote, continental tradition or civil law traditions, uh, there is, so, so it's the court that names experts. So, so he, he, in, in a common law system, each party brings their own experts, uh, whereas in the civil system, um, uh, the, 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 it is the court that, you know, has lists or, you know, internal, I have no idea specifically how they do it, but, you know, they, the court names an expert and, and, and then both parties pay that expert or however experts are needed according to what the court thinks. Um, now, some people in common law jurisdictions um, think that this is a magical solution and that this will resolve all of our problems and that we won't have any more, you know, we'll have the right experts because it's actually lawyers who are horrible people who, uh, you know, make, you know, all of this adversarial business and that we should have instead judges who are you know, impartial and they don't care about the outcome and right. Uh, this debate, by the way, is very uh, prominent in my native Quebec because we are a mixed kind of uh, system where it's civil law, but our courts are very much operating in a common law mode. Uh, at the same time, however, this code of procedure here in Quebec gives judges the power to say, you know, to do all sorts of things, namely to name 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 uh, experts, but also to sit, to tell parties like uh, 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 like you, you two are going to decide on one expert together, and it's just going to be one expert. So judges can do that in Quebec; they're empowered to do it. They don't um, they don't typically do it, especially not on the standard of care uh, for very because it's such a touchy subject. Deciding the standard of care, what it is, and whether or not it was met. It's, it's really the heart of the malpractice trial. And so, you know, if you, if you say, oh, it's gonna be this expert instead of that, like there's really a lot at stake. Now, let's even suppose that we had the civilian system and that, you know, it was, there wasn't a debate. Well, I would say that it doesn't solve any of this because, but it makes it go behind the scenes because for judges and the, you know, the court, the machinery of the court, like it's a bureaucracy, okay? And so the, the machinery of the court that, you know, draws up a list of experts that says who is on, who can be on the list, who cannot be on the list, who are we going to take for this case? It's, it's still going to be informed by these general things that are in our culture that the, 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 the virtue of our adversarial system is that it makes it all visible and it's all, you know, in all its messy glory uh, before us. Um, so, whereas if you're doing it in a civil system, those calls are still gonna be made. They're still gonna be assessing the credentials. Oh, this, this, oh, this one went to Oxford. Oh, okay, you don't wanna go for, you know, or whatever, right? You name it, same thing. Oh, this one, we know like uh, she's a member of such and such a party. Oh, uh, you know, he's, you know, observant, uh, observant Catholic, like we don't trust these people. You know, like, so I don't think it, I think this is just part of how, uh, you know, it's part of the dilemma and the challenges of, of giving um, epistemic authority that we don't get out of. Thank you for that. A very helpful answer. Um, I don't think that there's any other, wait for a moment, I don't think that there's any other questions that have come in. Uh, this has been fascinating. I've learned a lot and I am confident everyone listening has or those who will listen in the future uh, and want to thank you for, for coming and sharing all that you shared. 
Um, and, and I suppose on that note, it is, unless questions fly in right now, I suppose it will be time to draw today's seminar to a close and, and certainly want to formally thank you on behalf of us all. Um, however, also have a couple of announcements to make. So this is, um, was our last speaker for the year 2021 which is unbelievable and it was a wonderful one. And so our next seminar will take place in the new year and that will be on January 12th where Rosalind Abdul and Owen Connolly will discuss involvement of the Consent and Capacity Board in challenging ethical impasses. And to sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder emails, of course, please email jcb.info at utoronto.ca and CSB students who are enrolled in the student seminar course, please remember to keep track of your attendance. And so Patrick, on behalf of all of us who are here today and in the future, just thank you so much for this very valuable presentation. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was uh, very nice.